What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Monday, February 26th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. Starting off, net zero days are numbered. Next up, Shell's LNG trading makes $2.4 billion in the final quarter of 2023. That's according to sources there. Next up, Qatar Energy to further boost LNG output. All this comes in light of what's been happening at home with the Biden administration stopping our LNG exports. So it's all completely fascinating. And then finally, research warns net zero policies risk plunging thousands into poverty. Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what's going on in the oil and gas finance markets. We saw prices slide the last really two days, that Thursday, Friday. We saw rig counts come out with some surprising stuff. And then uh, we did see a merger um, between Cord Energy and Enerplus. I'll, I'll kind of give some quick highlights and thoughts there. And then there are three companies, Vital, Southwestern, and EOG, all with some interesting earnings nuggets that I want to, to just quickly highlight. And then we'll let you guys get out of here. Um, appreciate everybody checking us out here. Energy News Beat Podcast. As always, I'm Michael Tanner, joined by the executive producer of the show, purveyor of the show, and the director of the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com, Stuart Turley. Kick us off. Hey, let's get ready to rumble here. Let's start out with net zeros days are numbered. I could only hope. Uh, there's no way we're going to get there, Michael. And uh, this one is going to be kind of tough. The public does not believe or has not been made to understand that it's going to be costly for them, Blanchard. Blanchard is, Oliver Blanchard is pouring water on the claim on the House of Lords in the UK. He's the uh, former IMF chief economist. If you don't know what the IMF is, it's imagine the Fed, but for like the entire globe. So they oh, have an yeah. incentive to... Keep it locked up and tight. And for for someone like this to be saying this, it's I mean, he's the former, so he's not right. currently there, but still. But still, he says the financial fiscal cost to achieve anything close to net zero. Um, it, it's he's he's dead on right. There's no way that we can fiscally get there. Uh, the wind is this is a quote: the wind industry is admitting the ability to generate wind power has been vastly Michael, wait for it overestimated <laughs> with the bursting of the wind really bubble. yeah the industry's messaging has switched to crude blackmail um rwe's german boss uh mark Kreber told the financial times it is of course concerning because the uk's climate targets cannot be achieved without offshore wind <laughs> They can't make it anyway. I mean, no. the offshore wind, we've seen an absolute bust. People are bailing out like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, projects are getting canceled left and right. I mean, the closest thing we're going to get to to the IMF saying this is the former chief guy over there. Because trust me, they've got an incentive over there to make sure this net zero stuff hits. So I always like to look at that. Um, you know, this was basically... Um, there was also this interesting German-owned electrical producer, RWE. They briefed the Financial Times that the level of government support funded through the guaranteed prices um, electricity are forced to pay for wind energy. So they're forced to pay for it now, even if it costs more. I, I found this also very interesting. The last uh, paragraph in here, Michael, says the purpose of writing net zero into law is the anti-democratic one of putting net zero beyond politics so that i thought was very admirable of him to admit that once these things are put in there it's they're trying to appease their base mm -hmm. and either the uk or the u.s uh just because you're trying to appease the base doesn't mean it's right <laughs> yep, absolutely. All right, what's next? <laughs> Let's go to the next one here. Shell, this is a good story. Um, Shell's LNG trading makes $2.4 billion in final uh, Q, uh, 2023 quarter. That's huge, dude. Wow. It uh, The Shell's LNG trading accounted for a third of Shell's Q4 profit. That's a lot of bucks, dude. I wonder if they got a, a Christmas bonus or just a turkey. Yeah, who knows? What's interesting about this is that, you know, this 2.4 billion number or about a third of Shell's 
Q to Q4 profit, which came in at about 7.2 billion. Yep. That's a number that they didn't disclose in their earnings report. So this is kind of a scoop by Reuters who or who got this story. So we didn't know, we just know that they made 7.2 and we covered the earnings on the show. We just know they made 7.2 billion of earnings. This knowing that a third of their profit came from LNG trading makes wow. it ext- again underscores the reliance and what this article goes to point on is the reliance specifically on their profitable oil and gas trading business it it goes on to mention that really there was this east west arbitrage between what the east was willing to pay for it and what the west was able to um um to ship it over there for it and for those of you who 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 are an economist like myself we love a good arbitrage opportunity it goes on to point out shell accounted for nearly 7 7- percent of the global LNG trading volumes of about 404 million metric tons in 2023. That's according to company data. Uh, I'll tell you, this is a, uh, the following, the next story here with Cutter is also just as important. This goes back to the Biden administration and you can tell by the energy thread when I make this next comment, Cutter energy to further boost LNG output. The Biden administration, by putting the ban on LNG exports, is 100% placating to his base. That has nothing else to do with that. And guess who's going to benefit? Russia, Qatar, and the rest of the world that are producing LNG. And who's going to get screwed? Us. State owned. This is Cutter said Sunday it will further boost its LNG production from the North Field. Uh, Energy Minister and Chief Executive of Cutter Energy, Saeed Al Kabi, uh, made the announcement in a press. Re- uh, this is pretty cool. Yep. Quote We have continued geologically and engineering studies and have drilled a number of appraisal wells in that area. I'm pleased today to announce these great efforts have been confirmed through technical tests of the appraisal wells, the extension of the Northfield's productive layers towards the West, which means the ability to produce significant additional quantities. This is huge. Listen to these numbers. Field estimate at 240 trillion cubic feet, which raises the gas reserves from 1,716 to more than 2,000 trillion cubic feet. It's a lot of gas. Man, pull my finger, baby. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think (laughs) your camera is just driving you nuts. It's driving me nuts right now. (laughs) Point of the matter is, though, it's this AI stuff. I mean, we we, we hate this AI stuff. It's killing me. Point of the matter is, though, guys, um, Qatar is set to take and any country that's able to export LNG in light of what the Biden administration has done is looking to take advantage of what theoretically, if especially if Biden wins another four more years, which... You know, we can only hope not. But let's say that happens. Well, that makes it really that give that further enhances that arbitrage opportunity, not for companies like Shell, but for companies who are really for these independent um, uh, super majors, which are these not independent super majors, these these uh, national oil companies who now are based not in the United States and can and have now access to the entire world market without the United States as a player. Cause we've got a lot of gas here too. Oh, absolutely. But um, let's see here on the uh, LNG uh, front. Uh, it is just crazy what the world uh, has mm-hmm. got going on. I've got it. I'm, I was pulling it up here. It was a little slow, but uh, when we sit back and take a look, the long-term contracts, you and I have been talking about the long-term contracts yep. over the last two years. We're missing out on a lot of long-term mm-hmm. contracts. So the U.S. is going to be relegated back into uh, fighting for the leftovers, which is not where you want to be in a market leader. So Well, and exp- not allowing the, exp- the, 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 the new permitting of, of LNG out of the United States has partly led to the reason why natural gas has tumbled here. I mean, it's not the sole reason natural gas has been falling, but I mean, we're sitting at a dollar 58 right now 
uh, on the futures curve. I mean, that's partly due to the fact that they're the long-term prospect of where we're going to take this gas is we don't know. So it's pretty crazy what's going on. And LNG is going to become and is becoming um, a, a, a huge profit driver for all these these companies and countries. Oh, it's uh, the import uh, facilities. Uh, there's 300, 280, I guess, in construction mm-hmm. or on the map. It's just nuts. Yep. All right. What's next? Hey, let's go to research warns net zero policies risk plunging thousands into poverty. Yeah. I'd even I didn't even touch that uh, and put that. I'd even put more on there. Millions will die. <laughs> <laughs> I would if you just see something like millions will die. You know that would be me. But new research has been published by the Institute in Community Studies. Uh, I went to the website and you have to mm. go through. It says, oh, here's where the study is but you got to buy it. So this article is pretty interesting. Um, Local councils and central governments were not trusted to lead sustainable changes. So members of public had no choice, but take matters into their own hands. Whenever we start mentioning the public or the leaders taking things into their own hand, I get nervous, dude. Uh, Here's a quote from Emily Morrison, director of sustainability from the Young uh, Young Foundation said, our research shows there is a will, an appetite, and even urgency amongst the public, including the most vulnerable uh, and poorest households to participate in the transition to net zero. It has to be done through climate policy. Yeah, that's an easy way to drive people to their grave. It is. It's just... I want to be the place where people can come and talk about openness of talking about physics and reality. Yeah. I, physics and fiscal reality matter. And mm-hmm. anyway, millions upon millions will die. If I was Carl Sagan, I'd say billions upon billions will be dead. Yeah. So. I mean, it, the, the problem is when you're, to bring somebody out of poverty, you have to provide them with an extremely affordable option that's also extremely efficient. It's not just, yes, in, in, in a perfect world, I'd love my car to have zero emissions. But guess what? The most efficient and cost-effective option has a trade-off of some small amount of emissions. And, you know, Thomas Sowell said it best. There are no good options. There are only trade-offs. So what are we willing to give on one side to give the other? Are, are we willing to basically keep the poor poor in order to make the environment, you know, marginally better? Or do we want to raise everybody out of poverty and have a slightly worse off environment margin on the margins? Well, I'll tell you what I take all day, every day. As, as the great, in, as the great and wondrous, um, uh, oh, I know that um, uh, both things can be true. And uh, and both of these things can be true. You can have your that's, low that's cost. That's uh, Tisha Schuler. Thank over you. At I, I had a brain cramp. Would love You're me good. some Tisha. And both of these things can be true. If it is worked out in both sides, you can have your ecologically good energy and your your low cost. It has to be worked together. No, absolutely. It, it definitely can. Um, but there is... It, but we also live in a world of 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 trade offs, and so I think that's what we have to we have to look here. And you know, we, yep. we may get you need to rewrite the title. You got anything else in the in the news part? It's it's been crazy. Oh, it's just been unbelievable. We got some crazy stories coming around the corner. Yeah, if you if you're an AT and T person, you've you've seen the craziness already. Oh, uh, you haven't um, even seen nothing yet. It's luckily, we're sponsored by Verizon, so we're good. Um, <laughs> not AT and T. But before guys, we'll hold, go ahead and jump into the oil and gas finance. But before we do that, we'll quickly pay the bills around here. As always, the news and analysis, for what it's worth, is brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. Um, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. We appreciate um, all the great feedback we have gotten. Visit us online again, www.energynewsbeat.com. Hit the description below. You can see all the links to the uh, the stories. You can see different timestamps. You can go back and listen to what's going on with Shell LNG um, and, and all of the rest. 
Um, you can also check out dashboard.energynewsbeat.com, our latest data uh, news product. We got a lot of cool developments coming up with that. Um, we're, we're working on a really exciting, uh, maybe we're working on it. We'll see how long it takes me to, uh, to, to spin up a prototype, but I'm really, we're, we, we've got some cool stuff on the horizon for the dashboard and, and, and a potential subscription. So guys hang with us there again. You can email the show questions at energy newsbeat.com, www.energynewsbeat.com. But let's shift over um, to the overall markets. I mean, from a market standpoint, we're, we're, we're sitting at all time highs, mainly off the back of Indivia earnings, um, which dropped on Thursday. I, you know, it's kind of crazy how the entire back of the, the the United States and the world economy is 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 now reliant on Indivia earnings. Um, but you know they go ahead and 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 smash through their projected revenues mainly off the back of uh, of all the GPU consumption uh, from the AI revolution. So um, absolutely incredible there. That's really driven the S and P five hundred to where it stands now at about fifty uh, five thousand eighty eight there at all time highs. Nasdaq trading uh, again around all time highs seventeen thousand uh, nine hundred thirty seven, looking to break that eighteen thousand. Uh, we did see the the the, the two year yield and the and the ten year yield fall uh, four point six for the two and four point two for uh, the ten year. Um, we've also seen the dollar index stay fairly stable um s and uh futures um both on the s p and nasdaq have fared have fared fairly decent this weekend um we did see crude oil take a pretty big tumble on tuesday or on uh friday we we, we started the day at above 78 dollars and, and currently now trading um 76 57 um we got a uh, an hour a couple hours before the market opens here so we'll see um, how things look to open. It looks to be a slight gap down at 76.49 uh, based upon where things are trading. Um, we did see Brent oil 83.66. Um, that was actually up a little bit. So that that east-west arbitrage, not just in the LNG markets, but specifically um, what's going on with these crude prices um, seems to be seems to be widening a bit. We saw natural gas prices trading down Closing the day at about a dollar fifty eight, um, not good there. Mainly again off as we continue to get warmer now. Things are you know, a, unfortunately during winter when we should have saw higher gas prices, we saw gas prices continue to fall. That seasonality of when we go through winter we consume more natural gas. When we when when we go into the summer we don't. We actually start injecting natural gas. It, it's going to be interesting to see kind of the long term prospects of where the forward curve for natural gas goes because right now you still have futures at about three three fifty a year out which is making some of these projects actually economical that i think are getting drilled um in in the natural gas space which, which i find hilarious because they're at a dollar fifty take out you know thirty percent you know take out thirty cents for a net bag and you're talking you're basically getting a buck per mcf that's not good that's not going to pay the bills um, anywhere, and I think it, uh, it, 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 it's going to lend itself here when we chat southwestern. Um, we did see U.S. rig count drop uh, or, or rise. It actually was up five week over week. We had a um, current count two hundred and sixty or uh, two hundred and twenty six. 626 excuse me that's up five from the week over week 231 in canada that's down three internationally we're up um, about 10 week over weeks uh, 965 majority of that um excuse me here let me pull it up here the majority of that um rig count increase does come from oil rigs we actually saw a drop of one natural gas rig so um, we saw one offshore rig come up, so people are wising up, at least in the short term, because you got to remember the re what, what? Why is it hard? Why why are natural gas projects hard to 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 make profitable right now? Well, because you make on you, you, your early flow time, especially on say like a Haynesville well or mm -hmm. or or an Eagle or or you know one of these you know in the Marcellus, your early time production is a lot stronger than your later time production. So who cares what the curve is a year from now? If you're drilling an IP in the thing this week, well, you're subjugating yourself to a dollar fifty-eight at the wellhead, and you know when you work that backwards to net, it's probably a buck. Fresh in all the other things that go into it. So you know, two weeks ago when we saw gas rigs spike by four, I just it's why it didn't make much sense to me, and why now you're seeing the you know minus one on the gas rig we saw last week. Chesapeake saying, "Hey, we're gonna run a rig, but we're not gonna complete them because we're gonna wait and basically use it like a BB gun. And right when gas prices get to where we want, boom, we'll go ahead and complete it and turn it in line. It's the same thing that we're gonna uh, talk about with Southwestern. Now, obviously, that merger 
um, becomes up. But it, it's it, at least these natural gas uh, guys have a little bit of sense. I would you should start cutting rigs a few weeks ago. Um, but before we, I think there's a couple things. We've got a few earnings to cover, but I want to talk about the Cord Energy Enterplus M&A deal. So that that happened on Thursday. Cord Energy and Enterplus, both um, uh, Williston Basin and, and, and Bach and Shale primary targets, um, EMP companies, they're going to go ahead and combine in an $11 billion transaction. Um, we could read a bunch of the top lines here, but mainly it's, a, it's an $11 billion stock and cash transaction. It represents... And of that split out, so it's an eleven billion dollar um, cash and stock transaction. It's about ninety percent stock. So they didn't. They trust me. They didn't go. They didn't. They're not putting much cash down. And about ten percent cash. Um, um, up, upon completion of the transaction, it's going to be about a 67, 33 percent split via Cord and Enterplus. For those of you who don't remember, Cord Energy was the combination of two premier companies. I mean, two premier companies. Oasis and Whiting, both which who have been have their bankruptcy issues. So I mean, it's just we we I just <laughs> top tier merger now going into another top tier merger. No, I'm just I, I I'm I, I'm I'm mostly well, being funny. Look, look um, I was time. never a fan of both Whiting or Oasis. Trust me. <laughs> look at the time. I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, you gotta go. Um. So top, you know, top. We got top tier M and A action going on here. I, I I'm, I'm mostly am making a joke. My over, I mean, here, some of the top line numbers. This is a primary operator. Um, they, they primarily operate in North Dakota in the Williston Basin. They've got about 1.3 net acres, and that 98% of that is split there in the Williston Basin. Um, their Q4 oil production on a pro forma basis is going to be about 287 million uh, BOP or BO. E per day. So remember, that's barrel of oil equivalent. Almost 90% of it is Williston. But this is what I found interesting. They're only a 56% oil versus natural gas split, meaning that 287,000 per day is pretty weighted towards natural gas. And their oil production is actually much, much lower. Um, you know, the street didn't necessarily like this too much. I saw one commentary that this was the, the perfect merger to happen five years ago. And I agree. I think <laughs> it's a little too late to the party, I think, to be honest with you. I mean, I think, I think unfortunately, both of these companies, you know, I mean, they've already, the, the, you know, the first line is, is the company expects to benefit from administrative syn and operating synergies. I mean, they're just, they're basically telling you you're getting laid off without telling you. I mean, wow. it's administrative synergies. Oh, if you're working in an office in Enterplus, I'd be shaking in your boots. I'd be looking where else you need to go because whoop, you're on the hook. Um, so Hi, honey, I'm I'm home early for dinner. <laughs> you're gonna be, <laughs> honey. I'm home. <laughs> yeah. Um, more like, honey, we got to move to Houston. Sorry, we've been living mean, because Enterplus is based in Denver, and. I mean, you're going to have to go from Denver. Imagine having to move from Denver to Midland for a job. That sucks. But um, it may be what has to happen because Denver as an oil and gas town is really dying. And Texas and you know, places like Midland, Dallas, Houston, they're growing, if only because that's where companies that's eventually all companies will be based out of Texas. Unfortunately, hey, you'll, either, you'll have Midland a field office in North Dakota and you'll have your headquarters in Houston and and. There ain't going to be much going on um, specifically in Denver. You're, you're going to have one Denver operator. So everyone's going to work for the mega corporation that ends up taking over the Wattenberg there. So, um, you know, again, if you're a cord, if you're if you're a cord shareholder, I think this is a, a an, an, an OK move. This all comes back to how can you acquire incremental production? We're about to talk about EOG. EOG reported their earnings on Thursday, and I think this is a good tie-in. I, I got to do my best to keep the threads like Stu has it. Okay, so EOG drops their earnings um, on on Friday um, or on Thursday night. They go ahead and 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 all the metrics seem fairly good. I mean, they only dropped about um, you know fiscal year twenty twenty two was about twenty five point seven million in total re or billion in total revenue. Fiscal year twenty twenty three, which we just ended quarter four, was only down to twenty four point one, and that's mainly due to a ten percent drop of realized not a realized pricing. So I mean, again, your revenue is focused mainly on what's happening top line with oil prices okay what's interesting is this though the street hated what 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 they talked about they were down and they're down over the two days down 
3.9 percentage points, much, much, much higher than other producers. For example, for you know, in that same time period, another peer of them or a smaller peer of them might be Matador. They were actually flat through this time period. So what's interesting, and they, and they don't come out and say this. They bury this deep. You have to scroll a little bit down. Okay, here we go. Announced two six point two billion dollar capital plan to grow oil production three percent. What? Wait a second here. You're telling me you need six point two billion dollars to grow oil production three percent? Absolutely insane. You want to know what's? I got awesome some fields. I'll sell them right now today. Yeah. Well, also look at this. You got to scroll down a little farther to get an idea of, okay, well, talk to me a little bit about what your growth was quarter over quarter. Okay. Your growth quarter over quarter was 3%. And you spent $1.2 billion to do that. What? $1.2 billion to increase a 3% oil production. That tells wow. you all you need to know why companies like Cord and Enterplus are combining, even if it's a suboptimal merger, even if it should have happened five years ago and, and you shouldn't have had whiting in it. It should have just been Oasis and Enterplus, okay? But we can we can uh, 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 qualm about that later. They're doing this because the incremental increase in oil production from drilling your own stuff isn't there. It's just not there. The only way to acquire the incremental barrel is go out in the open market and get If EOG, widely considered one of the smartest and most technically savvy independent oil and gas companies out there, if they're telling you it's going to take them $1.2 billion to grow oil production 3%, what's that telling you about these new wells that they're drilling? They are not as productive as the old ones they're drilling because they're having to spend more money year over year. Now, they're doing it in a capital efficient manner, but the street doesn't like that. That's absolutely insane. It also goes to show when Vital Energy reports fourth quarter earnings product, uh, uh, fourth quarter earnings, all indicators net income is good, adjusted net income is good, cash flow looks fine, EBITDAX is good. They put down in here, and this is IR guy of the week here, organically added 185 new oil-weighted locations. Their stock price drop, dropped. So what does that mean? You spent all of this money to organically add 185 new locations. I don't know what that means. I don't know what, what organically adds means. You just drew some sticks on the map and we're like, oh, great, they're there. The street thinks so little of that that your stock dropped. I, I don't understand organically add unless it's like not organically taking sourced. So they, it's, yeah. you know, they did it, it in a sustainable It's like not manner. taking a shower in COVID. I, no, mean, I mean, organically added would mean you have acreage. You maybe you drilled the test wells. You, you had, you had some unexplored acreage that maybe had some, some, some P some three P reserves associated to it, which are, you know, highly, highly, um, you know, undeveloped, you know, unproven, all that jazz. You go drill a test well, and maybe you get some good results. You drill a, you know, a $800,000, 5,000-foot vertical well, and you get 45, 50 barrels a day. It stays, stays like that for three months. Oh, now I got something here. And then you do a couple other things, and based upon that development, you say, oh, well, now we believe because we've got, you know, three vertical wells, they're doing X. We can, you know, we know what the, we know the, 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 the what the sand looks like. We feel like we've got good well control. We understand what the formation's doing. We can accurately assign a multiplier on a per thousand foot basis. So if we drill a 5,000 foot lateral, we have a pretty good idea of what that IP might be. You know, I mean, the old adage, some, some people would say, if you, you know, you drill a vertical well and you do a two stage frack, you get 50 barrels a day. Well, if you did a 26 stage frack, start doing the math. All of a sudden you're now at a thousand barrels a day because think about it. You got 26 stages, divide that by two because you did a two stage frack. So that's 14, take 50 times 14. You're at 2000 barrels a day. Now I'm not saying any well is going to do that per stake, but that's how some of that thinking in these undeveloped fields look like. So that's probably what they're talking about when they mean they organically added 185 uh, new oil weighted locations. The problem is the street thinks so little of it. They act their stock price fell. So again, why are we seeing all of this M&A activity real quick? In my opinion, and I think this is well documented, I'm not saying anything that's like, oh my goodness, what a genius. Still, I'm a genius, but genius, genius, genius. Um, it's because the incremental barrel is much easier bought 
than it is developed. And you're going to get more, you're going to get a lot more value from the street. And when I mean the street, I mean the capital markets than you are if you go to try to develop locations. It's just, it's clear. It's what, it's clear with what's happening. And you're going to, you know, there's a few more, there's only a few more of these deals to happen before it's going to become a real game of the haves and the have nots. Yep. So it's, it's, I think we learned a lot throughout this um, throughout this earnings season. Again, we also did see Southwestern um, drop their earnings. I mean, just to give you guys an idea of what low gas prices can do for a company in fourth quarter 2023, they had a net loss of $658 million, whereas the year prior they had a $2.9 billion gain. So, mm. you know, pretty uh, – Pretty incredible what lower natural natural gas prices were due. You know they're going to obviously make that combination with Chesapeake, and and we kind of, you know, we we, we saw early, we saw last week what Chesapeake is going to do. They're basically going to keep their they're going to lower their rigs running, and they're going to completely drop their frack count so that they can have what they call TILs, new phrase that let people like to throw around, turn in line, which basically means everything is set to just frack the well, drill out the plugs and boom. Now we're, now we're tapping into the sales line. So, you know, on a go forward basis, I think we're going to see them specifically this new merger, this, this new company, whatever they call themselves. I think it's going to be, I think they're going to keep the Chesapeake name, but I'm not sure what they're going to do with the name. Hmm. You have to keep the Chesapeake name. You can't shred it. I, I, you got some brand name recognition. Absolutely. That. You're I mean, you know, coming from the, coming from the SEO guy himself. Um, <laughs> but no, it'll be interesting to see, see how that all plays out. That's all I've got, Stu. You got anything else? Oh no. It just get ready for a fun week. We're going to have a lot of good things coming around the corner. Yep. we got a deal spotlight dropping specifically on, um, um, the Diamondback and Endeavor, me and John Farrell over at Well Database. Nice. That'll drop probably Tuesday. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and try to get one recorded specifically for the Cord Energy um, and Enterplus one. So stay up to speed on that. Uh, Stu's dropped a bunch of uh, uh, conversations um, this weekend with, with kind of cleaning out the uh, cleaning out the old inventory. Uh, what else is coming up for us? Oh, we just have a bunch. I'm running a little bit behind here, but we got Doom. Me, David Blackman, and Doomberg is about to come out. Yes. So that was another. And that'll be my second podcast with Doomberg. Love I love Doomberg. Love me some Doomberg. And uh, uh, just released a few of them. And uh, we got a lot more great feedback. A lot coming up. So, all right, guys. Well, with that, we'll let you get out of here. Start your Monday. Stay strong, guys. You only got a few meetings, and then you will get out of here, and it will be Tuesday. Thanks for checking us out. World's Greatest Podcast, energynewsbeat.com. We'll see you tomorrow.